We have any more, Kathleen? Okay. Good morning, everyone. It is good to see you all this morning. Anybody have announcements? You survived the storm, right? So I think you're talking about all that. So, yeah. So uh, and everybody's power is back, right? A um, couple of things. So our dinner for uh, primary election day is going to be Tuesday, um, as you all know. And um, I think we have all the food covered. We can still need extra help. So if you can drag anybody else in that hasn't signed up, that's great. Um, we serve from 4 to 8. And um, so, you know, we'll probably start setting up a little before that, so 3 o'clock or so. And uh, we always need help for cleanup, so if you have to work that day. Um, also today after worship, um, if you can stay for a few minutes and you're able to help with tables and chairs, that would be great. So we can get the inside set up and we'll save a few tables for outside as well. Um, so folks have that option if they choose. Um, I forgot to say this at St. Paul, so but now everybody um, online will hear it too. I have extra... Um, uh, uh, Black-Eyed Susans to dig. I'm moving a flower bed. We're putting a playground in there. So um, I have lots of Black-Eyed Susans, and I have a lot of uh, daffodil bul bulbs that we've dug up. So if anybody would like any or know if somebody that does would like some, let me know, and I will be glad to share and deliver um, if need be. Okay. Let's uh, stand for the call to worship. In the quiet of the morning, as we stir to greet the day, God hears our sighs and gives strength to our spirits. In the busyness of the day, as we work and strive, God goes with us, giving us courage and confidence. In the tiredness of the evening, as we begin to settle down, God is present, refreshing and comforting our souls. In the hush of night, as sleep overcomes our weariness, there is God watching over us with patient love. Thanks be to God throughout all our days. Let's sing Gather Us In.
Please be seated. And let's join together in prayer. We confess, O oh God, that there are times when what we want far exceeds what we need. We often go to great lengths to acquire what we desire. Like King Ahab, we become resentful and sullen when we don't get our way. We are reluctant to acknowledge the consequences of our own actions, ignoring your cries for justice. Even when we live more simply, we remain tempted to judge what other people do and say. Forgive us, O oh God, when we succumb to the forces of sin, greed, judgment, and death, when we act as if you are not here with us, when we fail to do the things we should. Holy God, help us to look at ourselves with honesty and open ourselves to understanding that you are leading us away from selfishness and greed to a life with you where we always trust in your forgiving, steadfast love. Amen. Hear these words of forgiveness. Hear the good news of God's love for us. It's not in the earthquake, not in the storms, not in the mighty deeds, but in the silence, in the gentle touch, in the quiet rain, that God says again, you are my beloved, I love you. We are forgiven and made whole. Thanks be to God. Amen. So our scripture lesson today is another story about um, Elijah. Um, you might have remember in the recesses of your imagination um, a little bit about this story of Naboth and his vineyard, um, but it's not a story that we look to frequently at all. Um, it does come up in the lectionary from time to time, but I don't think I've ever really preached on it before. So it's, uh, but it's an interesting story, especially in this, um, this series that we're doing, this succession of stories uh, where we learn about Elijah. So later, the following events took place. Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of King Ahab of Samaria. And Ahab said to Naboth, give me your vineyard so that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is near my house. And I will give you a better vineyard for it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give you my ancestral inheritance. Ahab went home resentful and sullen because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him, for he had said, I will not give you my ancestral inheritance. Ahab lay down on his bed, turned away his face, and would not eat. His wife Jezebel came to him and said, why are you so depressed that you will not eat? And he said to her, because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, give me your vineyard for money, or else if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard for it. But he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. His wife Jezebel said to him, do you now govern Israel? Get up, eat some food, and be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. She sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who lived with Naboth in his city. She wrote in the letters, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth at the head of the assembly. Seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them bring a charge against him saying, you have cursed God and the king. And then take him out and stone him to death. The men of his city, the elders and the nobles who lived in the city did as Jezebel had sent word to them. Just as it was written in the letters that she had sent them, they proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth at the head of the assembly. The two scoundrels came in and sat opposite him, and the scoundrels brought a charge against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth, Naboth cursed God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. And then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned. He is dead. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Go, take the possession of your vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. As soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab uh, set out to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. And then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Go down to meet King Ahab of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He is now in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. You shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? 
You shall say to him, thus says the Lord, in the place where dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, dogs will also lick up your blood. Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. I will bring disaster on you. I will consume you and will cut off from Ahab every male bond or free in Israel. Here ends the reading of our scripture. May God add understanding to all of us. And we need a lot of understanding on that one. So, um, but we're going to start with the kids. Uh, <laughs> you haven't heard that one before? So, yep. Okay. Well, we'll talk about it. So. Oh, yeah, okay, so, all right. Well, my young friends, come on up. All right. Hi, guys. Oh, come on, Penny, come sit over here. You know I need like, extra girls. Yeah, so. Did you, I don't know if you guys could see this or not because he was looking the other way, but Wyatt has been watching that <coughs> screen all morning. So, <laughs> so how's everybody? Yeah? Huh? So. <laughs> um, so you guys might know that I like the Berenstein Bear books. And I have lots of them at home. And this one's called Get the Gimmies. And I know I've read it before, but it's been a long, long time since I've read it here. So you guys might not remember. The reason I remember I read it for sure is because, um, and this has been years ago, Martin Hendricks was here with us. And um, after I read this book, he said he needed to give that to his great grandkids <laughs> because it has a good message so um do you guys know what get the gimmies is do you ever go into a store or someplace and see some candy or some toys that you want and you really want it and you tell your mom or your dad or your grandparents or whoever that you really really need it hmm? has that ever happened hmm? Hmm? so i'm sure not to you guys not to you guys so but, uh, but anyway, this is ha what happens when um, the gimmies happen to the bears, the um, sister and brother bear. Okay. Of course, the members of the bear family who lived in the big tree house down a sunny dirt road in bear country loved each other. They loved each other very much. Brother and sister bear loved their mama and papa, and naturally mama and papa loved their cubs, and of course they were nice to them, as nice as could be, but sometimes, sometimes, they were a little too nice. Sometimes the cubs got too many treats and too many toys and too many rides on the bucking duck at the mall. That, maybe that's why brother and sister bear got the gimmies. Or maybe it was because there were treats, toys, and fun things to do wherever they looked, at the supermarket, at the mall, on TV, just about every which where. Maybe that was why they began making a fuss to get what they wanted, especially at the supermarket checkout, where there were always stacks and stacks of candy and other goodies. Now, cubs, Mama Bear said as the family got into the checkout line and she saw that old gimme gleam in their eyes, we can't have a big fuss every time we pass candy. I simply won't have it. But Mama Wine's sister, they have gummy gumballs. They're my favorite. And Chewy Chompers, my favorite wine, brother. Now, hush, said Mama. I simply won't listen to another word. And that's when Papa smiled and said, now, Mama, you're the, you're an, you're only a young cub once, and handed the cubs their favorite treats. It's only too true, said Mama, as they were leaving the supermarket, that you're only young once. But that's all the more reason to learn proper behavior while you're still young. And I certainly think, <gasps> look, look, shouted sister, a new ride. Hey, a bucking frog, shouted brother. That looks even better than the bucking duck. May we ride it, please? May we please, 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 please? You guys never say anything like that, do you? Now, Papa had just bought them treats, and he thought it was enough for one day. But the cubs had made such a fuss that he sighed, dug into his pocket, and put some money in the slot. Papa looked at Mama and shrugged. Cubs will be cubs, he said. It may be true that cubs will be cubs, said Mama, as they walked across the parking lot to their car. But that's no excuse for jumping up and down and making a scene every time they see what they want. Look, look, shouted the cubs again. Little rubber cats that stick out their tongues when you squeeze them. Cubs, said Mama, that will be quite enough. I don't want to hear another word. Oh, please, they shouted. Can we have them? Please, please, please. And Papa decided it was time to put a stop to all that fussing. Stop that fussing, he said louder, in this loudest Papa Bear, bear voice. 
but they were making such a commotion they didn't even hear him. Sister was jumping up and down so hard that she fell over backwards and started kicking her feet in the air. Please, 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 shouted the cub so loudly that the whole parking lot was looking. Or they um, uh, said embarrassed Papa to the toy seller, two of the rubber pussycats, please. The rubber pussycats not only stuck out their tongues when you squeezed them, they went squeak, squeak as well. And they squeak, squeaked all the way home. Mama was quite annoyed by that time. Um, by the time they got back to the treehouse, and Papa was so angry he could hardly speak. It wasn't until the cubs had gone about their business and Mama had made a pot of tea that Papa's voice came back loud and clear. Of all the outrageous, disgraceful, embarrassing behavior I have ever seen, he roared, that selfish, greedy performance by our cubs was the worst. Brother and sister have the worst case of the galloping, greedy gimmies that I have ever seen. Yes, said Mama, calmly sipping her tea. But have you ever stopped to think about why they have the gimmies? Perhaps their greedy behavior isn't all their fault. Perhaps it's partly our fault for giving in every time they make a fuss. Papa listened quietly. Perhaps so, he said. It's up to us, she continued, to explain things to them, to help them understand why it's important not to be greedy. Then Papa called the cubs in for a talking to. He told them why it wasn't a good idea to be selfish and greedy and want everything in sight. Selfish, greedy cubs, he explained, can never be happy because you just can't have everything you want all the time. Life isn't like that. Do you understand? Oh, yes, Papa, we understand, they said. And he talked to them about counting their blessings, which meant enjoying the things they had instead of forever wanting more and more and more. Does that make sense to you, he said? Oh, yes, Papa, they said. It makes a lot of sense. And that's when the cubs heard the sound of a familiar car door. It was Grizzly Gramps and Gran come to call. Well, brother and sister ran to open the front door, and as Gramps and Gran came up the steps, they made the biggest fuss yet. What'd you bring me, they screamed. What'd you bring me? What'd you bring me? And that did it. Up to your room, roared Papa, up to your room, and no TV or treats for a week, for a month, for a year. And the cubs knew that wasn't the time to argue. They scurried up to the stairs to their room. We seem to have come at a bad time, said Gran. What about these things we brought with us, asked Gramps, a puzzle for brother and a top for sister. Your presence will have to wait, Gramps, answered Mama. I'm afraid brother and sister have a bad case of the gimmies. The galloping, greedy gimmies, added Papa, the worst case I've ever seen. And the cubs opened the door, their door a crack to listen. The worst case, you say, said Gramps, looking Papa in the eye. Seems to me you were quite a gimme cub yourself when you were little. Brother and sister sneaked to the top of the stairs so they could hear better. I was, said Papa. Of course, we didn't have malls or supermarkets back then, but there was old Rufy Grizzly's general store. Wonderful place, sold just about everything. Honey cake, licorice sticks, molasses apples, and all sorts of toys and novelties. And did you ever have the gimmies? Did you ever? You wanted everything in sight, downright embarrassing. Why, it got so bad we couldn't go there anymore. So we worked out a deal, said Gran. When it came time for a trip to the general store, we had you decide on a treat ahead of time. It could be a sweet, a toy, or a book. And that was it for the day. Right, said Gramps. And if you came down with the gimmies, we went right home and you got nothing. Well, that sounds pretty good to me, said Mama. Me too, said Papa. And the cubs tiptoed back to their room. It, and it sounded okay to them too. <coughs> Excuse me. The next time the Bear family went to the supermarket, they tried the Gramps and Grand plan. And it worked. Brother decided he would get a book about dinosaurs, and sister wanted a new box of crayons. Mama and Papa were very proud when the cubs passed the candy rack without so much as a peep. Brother and sister were pretty proud of themselves, too. But then they heard it, the familiar sound of a cub with a bad case of the gimmies. The kicking, screaming cub was just behind them in the checkout line. You never heard such a fuss. What outrageous, disgraceful, embarrassing behavior, said sister. May we leave? Yes, said brother. Let's get out of here. And that's how brother and sister bear got rid of a pretty bad case of the galloping greedy gimmies. All right, so you guys are never going to get the gimmies again, right? Mm. Yeah, so, and you guys too, huh? So all of you, mm, I bet. All right, let's stand up and say our prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Theologian Katie Cannon tells a great story that fits for uh, many times in our lives. And it was uh, back in the early 1800s when this great organist was playing this masterful concert. And at the end of this first set of music, he discovers that he's pretty pleased with himself and his performance. And the crowd agrees, and they have risen to their feet in a cascade of bravos. And he's moved to speak, and he says, yes, this was my best performance ever. And as he speaks, the custodian who had been in charge of blowing the air into the pipes, remember this was a long time before organs were electrified, um, the uh, custodian who was in charge of blowing the air into the pipes of the magnificent organ joined him on stage. And the custodian says, yes, this has been our best performance ever. Well, the musician is furious and gets in this huff. What do you mean? Did you attend music school? Did you practice every day? Did you reach deep into your soul to evoke that music? And the custodian kind of slithered off stage. So the organist sits down to play his second set, and he places his hands on the keys and his feet on the pedals of the organ, and nothing happens. No music comes out. And he tries it again. He puts his hands on the keys and his feet on the pedals again, and still nothing happens. And everyone begins to realize at the same time that the custodian is not providing air for the organ pipes. So the organist stands up, and he graciously thanks the custodian for his labor and his faithfulness over the years, and then returns to his bench. And that time when he put his hands on the keys and his feet on the pedals, magnificent music emerged. We need to remember from where our air comes. We need to remember whose air we play. Most of us could tell of a time when we forgot where our air comes from. And it certainly applies to King Ahab. Ahab thought everything was his. He had no concern for anyone else, least of all God. But everything was not his. And he forgot from whence his air came. That garden in our story this morning belonged to Naboth no matter how much Ahab wanted it. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's life, or his job, or her car, or their gardens. This is a story, my friends, about coveting and wanting what others have. And it's a story about envy and greed and ultimately destruction. 
Preacher and writer Fred Beekner explains our story like this. He says, to make a sordid story short, Naboth had a vineyard that Ahab wanted so much he could taste it. And when Naboth refused to either sell or swap, Ahab went into a sulk. Our scripture says he laid down upon his bed, turned away his face, and would eat no food. It was the kind of opening Jezebel was always on the lookout for. And she said to him, well, are you a king or a cup of jello? Um, and she proceeded to take charge. Found guilty of a trumped up charge, Naboth got stoned to death, and Ahab got the vineyard, and also, needless to say, he got a visit from Elijah. So just imagine for a moment, my friends, a king wanting a garden. It's like a pastor needing another book or another pair of shoes. Most of us can identify with the covetousness of this story. And it can't be an accident that the bulk of our Ten Commandments are about wanting what is not ours. We all see ads for another techno gizmo and think we have to have it. We get the gimmies. We don't really have to have it, but we convince ourselves that we do. And it's not really the gizmo either. It's the image of us with the gizmo. It's the image of our owning the field. Somehow in our minds, it makes us more powerful or more beautiful or smarter or, or whatever it is that we think we need. And really, I didn't plan purposefully to preach this sermon during Amazon Prime Week. But I have to be honest that I found myself scrolling through the list of sale things many times, even though I do not have Prime, because I insist that I do not need it. And besides, I can get my daughters to order things for me, and then I don't have to, you know. So... <laughs> We are reading through the story of about the prophet Elijah this summer, which revolves around his relationship with the worst king of Israel, King Ahab, who was married to Queen Jezebel. Now, even if you've never heard of these three characters before, you probably can imagine in your head what Queen Jezebel was like, because that name has gone down through the ages and become synonymous with someone who is just evil to the bone. The definition of a Jezebel is a shameless or morally unrestrained woman who has no respect for anyone. And in this part of the story today, Jezebel really shows her stuff. King Ahab is in his palace in Jezreel, one of his two palaces, when he looks out the window one day and he sees these beautiful rolling hills covered with vineyards that just happen to be owned by Naboth. King Ahab immediately wants that from his prime account with next day delivery. So Ahab goes and knocks on Naboth's door. He says, I want your garden. I need it for a vegetable garden. Sure, Ahab is thinking about uh, zucchini and collards, right? So Ahab wants to either buy it outright with cash or trade it in for a piece of land that Naboth could have instead in some other place. And Naboth says no immediately. Ahab sees this land as a commodity that can be bought and sold which was very rare in those days. You didn't just go out and buy a piece of land or buy a house. Land and homes were passed down from generation to generation. And that wasn't just a nice tradition of the time. It went back to when God divided up the promised land among the 12 tribes of Israel, and each family was given certain land. It was to be their permanent possession. They were never to sell their land to anyone else. God told them they could rent or lease their land out, but in 50 years, that land would come back to the original family. It was called the year of Jubilee. And that would ensure every family would have an inheritance from the Lord to pass on to their children and their children's children and all future generations. It was their gift from God. It was their promised land. So while economically Ahab's deal wasn't bad at all, it would disregard God's instructions and God's promises. So Naboth very matter-of-factly said, the Lord forbid that I give you the inheritance that was passed down by my ancestors. This land is not a bartering tool for wealth. It was a blessing from God. So well, Ahab gets in a huff and turns on his heel and leaves and returns to the palace and goes to his room sulking like a three-year-old. 
How dare Naboth quote the, rule of, uh, uh, the rules of Israel to the king? What good is all the king's wealth if it can't buy him happiness? What good is power if you can't use it to persuade and convince and lobby to get you what you want? So Ahab continues to sulk, staring out the window at, his, at this tantalizingly beautiful vineyard right next door that he can't have. And he doesn't take rejection well. He is quite the drama king. So, well, before long, Jezebel shows up. Oh, my dear king, what's the matter? Well, she hears a story, and she knows just what to do. She will take care of things. Manipulation is her game, after all. So Jezebel orders a day of of prayer and fasting to make the whole thing look religious, and then rather effortlessly frames Naboth with these two scoundrels who agree to lie and accuse him falsely of both treachery and sedition, and Naboth is stoned to death. It's a piece of cake for Jezebel. And by the way, they wouldn't have just stoned Naboth on that day, but they would have stoned his whole family because back then the whole family paid for the crimes of the father. Darn, then there's no one left to inherit the vineyard. It's not a nice little Sunday school story for the kids. So then Ahab gets to go out and take a stroll around his new vineyard. And that's about the time that God tells Elijah to hustle on down to Jezreel. Then God filled Elijah on on all that had happened and what he needed to say. Ahab saw him coming and stomped over to the edge of the vineyard to meet him. And Elijah let loose. I want to tell you something, Ahab. I I want you to know that God sees everything and that even what you do in secret is known by God. I want you to know that God has rules about the proper use of power and about protecting the rights of the weak. I want you to know that this little thing called justice that happens in this land and God has called me to proclaim it. Oh, and one more thing, Elijah said, in the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, they will lick up your blood too. Don't try to pretend that, you're not, uh, that you weren't in on this the whole time. If you're reading the, your, your Bible at home, go on to chapter 21, where it says, indeed, there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord, urged on by his wife Jezebel. And then, if you continue to read, believe it or not, Ahab repents. He tears his clothes and he puts on sackcloth and fasted. That sackcloth, uh, you might remember, is, is this rough, coarse fabric. It's kind of hard to wear, probably made of goat's hair. It was a sign of, of, of submission, of self-humiliation. Ahab realized that he had done wrong and he was sorry for it all. But that only lasted for a minute. Not long after that, Ahab goes into battle with his army and cowardly disguises himself as a common soldier so he's not targeted as king in the battle. However, nevertheless, um, a stray arrow pierced his side and he died. And not only did the dogs lick up his blood, but the prostitutes bathed themselves in it, another thing that they don't teach you in Sunday school. Later on, Jezebel is thrown out a window of the very palace in Jezreel, and yes, the dogs get her too. If you're like me, when you read all that stuff, you think, why is this in our scripture? Um, why, why do we have to know this stuff? Why do we have to remember these, these kinds of stories? And there are multiple explanations, but here's one of them. The Old Testament narrative is trying to make something very clear to us, even today. God is not on the side of those who abuse power. God is on the side of the slave and the beggar and the immigrant. God is always on the side of the poor and anyone who is abused or bullied or is different from what we consider to be the norm. And it should be very clear whose side then we should be on too. We should be on the side of those who need people by their side. Ahab and Jezebel were the perfect example of what not to do, of how not to live, of how not to rule Israel or anywhere else for that matter. Um, uh, Theologian Rachel Hackenberg points out that 
Ahab and Jezebel have violated at least six of the Ten Commandments in the few chapters that we've read. They broke the first commandment by worshiping other gods. They broke the second commandment by making a graven image of their god, Baal. They broke the sixth commandment by having Naboth murdered. They broke the eighth by stealing the vineyard. They broke the ninth by bearing false witness against Naboth. And finally, they broke the tenth by coveting Naboth's vineyard in the first place. Ahab and Jezebel have maliciously and violently taken advantage of their power to get what they wanted, no matter the cost. They had no concern of the, for the collateral damage that, caused, uh, that they caused to all of Israel. They were seduced by the calls of their culture and their quest for more and more power. And they never acknowledged who breathed into their pipes. It's not so different today. Oh, maybe we've never coveted a vineyard, right? However, all of us in our first world nation are a part of a privileged society that often chooses to take advantage of the Naboths around, among us. Is, Ahab's taking, uh, is Ahab taking Naboth's land really any different than our own nation taking land from native peoples who lived here before our nation was founded? Stories like this, hopefully, open our eyes to the way Ahab's and Jezebel's to, um, act today and, and throughout history and how they have taken advantage of the poor and the powerless. Elijah was called by God to speak truth to power. Power tried to ignore him. And Ahab and Jezebel certainly didn't stop their terror because of those reminders from Elijah. They continued their entire lives to try to get what they wanted and stepped over whomever was in their way. Envy and greed were the way they lived each day. Even seeing God um, burn up that soaking wet altar, stones and all, didn't convince them. Hearing about Naboth's vineyard reminds us of the countless ways that people are taken advantage of today and how easy it is for those in power to twist the truth and manipulate the system to their own advantage. Like Elijah, we need to stand up for truth and resist the power of evil in the world. As Howard Thurman once wrote, there is no need to fear evil. There is every need to understand what it does and how it operates in the world and what it draws upon to sustain itself. We must not shrink from the knowledge of the evilness of evil. I like that phrase. It is just as important as ever to attend to the little graces by which the dignity of our lives is maintained and sustained. Birds still sing. The stars continue to cast their gentle gleam, and the heart is still inspired by the kind word and gracious deed. To drink in the beauty that is within reach, to clothe one's life with simple deeds of kindness, to keep a sensitiveness to the movement of the Spirit of God, that is always the ultimate answer. One of the things I read this week ended with, you can't always get what you want, but by golly, you can do what God wants, and that's how we get what we need. May it be so for all of us. Let us pray. Oh Lord, may we take a few lessons from this ancient story that applies so well to the world we live in now. May we be reminded that we can't always get what we want and that somehow you are what we need more than anything else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's time for us to share our prayer concerns and our joys and thanksgivings and the ways we've seen God at work this week. Anyone have something to share? Go ahead, Arlene. I have a whole bunch of things. Oh, good. But I'm try <laughs> trying to limit it. Some of it is, seems so silly, and some of it is quite serious. Um, on a good, on a good white note, my daughter wanted to be a farmer. She volunteered, then she got a job working on a farm. And they're doing very well selling flowers. And the gal who owns it said she's finally making a profit. And Karen said something to her about, well, what to do with the things that they have to throw away, like the flowers that aren't sold. And they came around and they decided they're going to donate whatever excess flowers they have over the weekend to a nursing home nearby. And I thought that was wonderful. Uh -huh. Karen said so she drives right there by there on Mondays. She'd be glad to drop mm -hmm. the flowers off. They were throwing in the, in the uh, common.
Sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. I thought that was really Yeah. Uh huh. I was at Saul's and I had a lot of groceries the other day. This woman had three things behind me. I happened to see her and I said, Why don't you go ahead of me? No, I'm very patient, she said. I said, Well, I am too, and I'm not in any hurry. And then she looked at me and I was moving slowly. She said, I think I will go ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, she got her couple things and I hadn't even finished putting my stuff on the the, the tray, whatever. And she was done, and she said, thank you. She said, I hope to see you again, and to return that, mm -hmm. that favor. And I said, oh, don't worry about that. I said, pay it forward right. to someone else. Sure. And yeah. she looked kind of surprised. Uh -huh. But I thought, well, maybe I planted a little seed. Yeah, yep. Then the other thing, I'm reading two books this week, and I have managed to leave a staff at 1 o'clock at night, <laughs> and I'm going be so wired that I'm getting up early. One is on Compassion by Joyce Brock which is really about compassion for others and ourselves and the earth. And I'll be finished soon because I'm giving it to you. Okay. <laughs> and then I read the book you gave me on Just Mercy, which gave me, oh, oh yeah. <coughs> the laws in our country and how people who are poor or black or poor whites just do not get any justice. Right. And it's all on this. Yeah. Most of it's focused on Alabama and uh -huh. Yeah. Death row and people right. are innocent. So I get on my Facebook this morning because I've got up early and I'm charged, which is terrific. I love being charged. I haven't been in a while. So I get on Facebook and right away there's Amnesty International, which I'm a member, and has the situation of a man in Alabama who is on death row and all these things that have not been done. And he keeps claiming he's innocent and he's been there for many years. And so they want people to petition to open up this case, reopen the case. And I thought, wow. And the other thing was these kids from Nigeria, Christians. Nigeria used to be a very Christian country. There are very few Christians left. Unfortunately, there's a lot of extremists Muslims who are killing these people off. And this one minister has managed to save and evacuate 136 orphans to a safe spot in a part of Nigeria which is still Christian. And these kids were all standing around laughing and singing and, you know, they were interpreting what they were saying and just thanking God and thanking the people who were supporting them with some money to help them have this. And these kids have seen brutality, a terrible brutality, because I've been following this for uh -huh. many years. So I thought, gee, that's really good. So that's how I saw God. Oh, and the other thing. I have two feral cats. We finally released them. I took them from a friend. And they didn't show up. They were gone. So we've been praying and praying. And last night, Ken says, Roxy's out there. And I thought, there's hope. Yep. There's hope. We've got one more that will come back. Yep, they will. To look for food. Yep. So God has been very good to me. Right, right. So awesome. That's just only one part of a couple of days. Yeah, yeah. You tell great stories, Arlene. We appreciate that. So <laughs> the everyday things that happen, we have to open our eyes to see God in. So. Others? Maggie? Well, <clears throat> I think with all of the storm that happened this past week, I think we've got a lot to be thankful for. For once, our community was on the right side of the ridge. Uh, normally we get dumped on with yeah. the snow and the ice up here. But... Um, uh, anybody who lives uh, south of 439 um, knows the devastation that went through the Moncton uh, area. Um, I'm very blessed. Um, my son was caught up in the middle of this. I was explaining that here before. Uh, he got caught up in the middle of it trying to get home. He lives on the corner of York and Mount Carmel. Uh, he got as far as the Moncton area and um, was basically trying to survive. Um, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a person that could live outside and be a survivor. And so based on what nature was doing and the way the trees were bending, he was trying to position his vehicle in such a way that he would be protected from the weather. And, and then the weather, the wind shifted, which put him in danger again. He went and tucked behind a tree that had fallen down and thought he'd be safe there, the wind actually turned his vehicle one quarter of a turn, blew his whole vehicle wow. sideways. Um, he got down as far as the trail that crosses in Moncton there, 
um, and, and got his vehicle up alongside of a brick building, mm -hmm. which he said, you know, saved him from right. there. But from there, he could almost walk to York and Mount Carmel, and it took two and a half hours uh, to get the, with right. people mm -hmm. helping to clear the roads yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, through there. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I've been back and forth through there numerous times this week. Uh, yeah. There's a staging area uh, at the parking lot where the Amish market is of all of these utility trucks mm -hmm. from out of town. There's a whole mm -hmm. contingency from mm -hmm. Michigan mm -hmm. that are there. Yeah, yeah. Um, just trying to get people's power. Yeah. Yeah. Back up. And anybody who follows between yeah. Facebook and the next door mm -hmm. app, and you yeah. can just see the devastation. I and mean, these people sure. have been out of yeah. power and losing the food, yeah. and mm -hmm. freezers aren't working. And right, right. Yeah. You know, on and on and on. Yeah. You right. know, so we were very blessed to yeah. be on the right, right. side of the bridge yeah. for a change. Yeah. So, yeah. Susie? So, in line with your message today, you can't always get what you want. The Rolling Stones concert last night opened up with the Ukrainian choir singing, You Can't Always Get What You Want. Wow. <laughs> so, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'll we'll have to uh, look that up. It's on the news. Uh -huh. All right. Thanks for sharing that. So, anybody else? Go ahead, Linda. Um, Leela got to show her calf at the fair. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I saw those pictures. Uh huh. Yeah. Cool. Cool. That's great. That's great. So, all right. Anybody else? Oh, uh, Marcy's doing well. She's home. Um, so she's sore and she's trying to wean herself off pain medicine, but, um, you know, that just takes a while. So, but she looks good. She's, uh, she's doing fine. Um, I talked to Luann earlier in the week. Um, she's doing okay. Um, just, you know, just one thing after another. So, uh, Robin and Dave are fine this morning. They have a dog that needs extra care. I think they have, they have a puppy that got neutered this week, so they can't leave him alone. So, um, Ruth Pyle was back home. I saw her. Okay, she back home again. Okay, good. Yep. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, yeah, uh huh. Now yeah. they've told her that she had pneumonia, which they had never told her before. Right, uh huh, yeah. She sounds fine. She said she feels fine. I saw her early in the morning before she went back to the hospital, and she said it's a combination of things. She ended up with uh, vertigo and a UTI and yeah. maybe a virus at the same time, so that yeah. pneumonia is probably part of yeah, it. She called me yesterday. Um, because so, she figured but, I had heard. I said, no, I actually hadn't heard yet. Yeah, it, well, I was waiting to hear more. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, so keep Ruth in your prayers as she gets her strength back. So, um, let's bow in prayer. Oh, holy God, we are so grateful to you that even in the storms of life, we see our blessings. This week, we could see amazing pictures of your universe through NASA's new telescope. And we are reminded of the vastness and awesomeness of your creation. And we give thanks for the many who were ready to help when the storm came through our own communities uh, this week and for those who are always willing to help their neighbors. We're reminded that there are still Ahabs and Jezebels in this world today who still take advantage of the poor and those who, without power. May we all stand up for justice and speak that truth to power. Hear our prayers for the people of Ukraine, for those in Uvalde whose wounds were reopened again this week for those in, affected, in areas affected by the extreme heat throughout the South and the Midwest, for those floods in Virginia. Our heart goes out to those who are struggling, those who are sick or grieving, those who are alone. We pray especially for Dave and the work he does in Haiti, for Michael and Linda and Janice and Leanne. We pray for Adam and little Molly who turns eight this week. We pray for Bob and uh, Joan, for Carol and Ellen, we pray for Craig, for Bonnie and Daryl and Kathy and Tom. We pray for Debbie as she awaits a kidney. We pray for Chris in rehab, uh, for Wanda, for Dave and Robin and give thanks that they're, they're doing well. We pray for Grayson, uh, for Jean. We pray for Leela and give thanks that she's doing well. We pray for Trisha and Elaine, for young James, for Luann, for Jeanette, uh, for Marcy as she recovers from her surgery, uh, for Ruth as she uh, gets her strength back, and for all those known in our hearts. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now let's share.
friends, like Elijah, stand up for the truth and resist the powers of evil in this world. Go in peace, sharing the peace of our Lord with your <laughs> brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. Amen.